If you notice the art for this episode, we have listener Becky to thank for that. You can check out all of Becky's amazing creations on Instagram at B-H-I-L-L-G-I-E. It is also in the show's notes. Thanks, Becky. She grew up in a small town in Illinois in the late 1800s and became known worldwide as an activist, reformer, and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. This is the story of Jane Addams and Hull House. I'm Tommy Henry, and this is the Chicago History Podcast. left in Women's History Month, I thought I'd focus on one more story about an influential woman from Chicago's history. This one was suggested by expat Rich. Thanks to you, Rich. To be sure, there is so much to Jane Addams' story and accomplishments that cannot possibly fit into a podcast of this length. But if all you know of the name Jane Addams is the never-ending construction on the Chicago Expressway that bears her name... This may help inform. Life for Laura Jane Adams started on September 6, 1860, the youngest of eight children in a town called Cedarville, Illinois, approximately 120 miles northwest of downtown Chicago and 33 miles past Rockford, Illinois. Her father, John H. Adams, was a founding member of the Illinois Republican Party, serving as state senator from 1855 to 1870, and even backed his friend Abraham Lincoln in his run for senator in 1854 and his presidency in 1860. He was also the largest landowner in Stevenson County. When Jane Addams was two, her mother died giving birth to her ninth child. At age four, Jane contracted tuberculosis of the spine, which caused a curvature and health problems that would trouble her throughout her life. A limp made it difficult for her to move. And according to Louise Knight in her book, Citizen, Jane Addams and the Struggle for Democracy, young Jane thought she was ugly and did not want to embarrass her father by walking down the street with him. By the time she was eight years old, four of Jane's siblings had died, three as infants, and one at age 16. Also when Jane was eight, her father got remarried to the widow of a miller in nearby Freeport, Illinois. Jane Addams was driven by the idea of helping people from a young age. According to her autobiography, she was riding in a buggy with her father to the larger town of Freeport, Illinois, when they passed through some of the poorer shanty sections of town. When she asked her father why anyone would live like that, her father said it was because they had no money. Quote, I declared with much firmness, she wrote, that when I grew up, I should, of course, have a large house, but it would not be built among the other large houses, but right in the midst of horrid little houses like that. Adam's goal was to help those in need by becoming a doctor. In June of 1881, Jane Adams graduated from the Rockford Female Seminary, now known as Rockford University in Rockford, Illinois, one of 17 graduates that year. That summer tragedy struck once again when Jane's father died of a sudden bout of appendicitis, leaving Jane and her siblings $50,000 each, just shy of $1.3 million in today's money. Pursuing her quest to become a doctor, Jane moved to Pennsylvania with her stepmother, sister, and her sister's husband and finished her first year of medical studies at the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia before health issues derailed her efforts. Dejected, she moved back to Cedarville with her whole family. Jane received surgery on her back to help straighten it. And in August of 1883, she set off for a two-year tour of Europe with her stepmother, Anna. By early 1887, Adams was directionless. But over the next two years, wow. After reading a magazine about the concept of a settlement house, she decided to travel to London, England to see one of the first... Toynbee Hall. Now, the concept of a settlement house was one that brought together those of different socioeconomic standings and abilities to create a community to help raise up those in need of that help. In 
1889, Adams and close friend Ellen Gates Starr rented an abandoned mansion at what is now 800 South Halsted Street at Polk Street to found Hull House, named after the home's builder, Charles J. Hull. Not America's first settlement house. New York beat us to that by a year. Hull House was situated in the 19th Ward on the near west side, an area dominated at that time by Eastern European immigrants. Many of those immigrants had limited skills and took low-wage meatpacking jobs or jobs at garment factories and sweatshops. Hull House set out to offer various social services to the community, including legal aid, employment assistance, child care, and training in domestic skills. There were kindergarten classes in the morning, activities for older children in the afternoon, and in the evening, adults could participate in what was essentially night school. At a time when infant mortality was frighteningly high and many homes were without proper bathrooms, Adams worked with other area reformers in urging city officials to build public baths for the poor. Chicago's government responded by building 21 modest public bathhouses in the poor immigrant neighborhoods between 1894 and 1918. Members of the staff at Hull House included educated white women from middle-class and upper-class families, some of whom lived at Hull House full-time. Other reformers who joined Hull House included Florence Kelly, Julia Lathrop, Sophonispa Breckenridge, Alice Hamilton, and Grace and Edith Abbott. They would also arrange for guest speakers at Hull House, including names like Clarence Darrow and Frank Lloyd Wright. A reporter from the Chicago Tribune spent a week at Hull House in October of 1891 and wrote about their experience. Quote, Never was there a better opportunity to put the term neighborliness to a practical test and to find out how deep and how far-reaching is its meaning, the writer shared. Between Halsted Street and the river live about 10,000 Neapolitans and Sicilians, a distinct Italian colony. South of Hull House are Germans, Poles, and Russians, a large Bohemian settlement. West are Canadian French, and north are Irish. All these people stood much in need of practical friends to whom they could go freely and without suspicion of red tapeism for advice, to whom they could take even trivial matter if they chose and be relieved of the load of apprehension which even little things under some circumstances cause. They wanted someone to take care of their babies in working hours, someone to visit their sick, someone to devise ways and means of keeping their children off the streets in the evening. The writer continued, In the same spirit in which it was offered, the friendly assistance of Hull House was accepted. Miss Jane Adams, according to the reporter, is a woman of tact, good sense, and keen sympathy, but of the broadest charity as well. She devotes herself, her time, her wealth to Hull House, but without the slightest sense of sacrifice. It is work I must do, she herself says, because it is the work I love. At a meeting at Central Music Hall on November 29, 1891, about the need for a contagious diseases hospital in Chicago, I'm definitely going to cover that in a future episode, Jane Adams was brought up to speak about Whole House. Concerning the need for additional resources for citizens, Adams said of a woman who worked in a cigar factory, quote, One of her two children took the scarlet fever. After applying in vain at the county hospital, she came to me and said, If I nurse my boy, I cannot go to work. If I don't work, I will starve. If I go to work, I dare not see my boy, and there will be nobody to care for him, and he may die. What shall I do? Adams finished her story with, I tell you, my friends, I was as much perplexed as that poor woman was. Cook County is surely rich enough to furnish a solution to this perplexing problem. By 1907, 12 additional buildings had been added until Hull House covered more than half a city block. The facilities included a playground, theater, gymnasium, a post office, libraries, pools, classrooms, including that kindergarten, and dorms. 
Hull House was serving the needs of thousands of people each week. Under the guidance of Jane Addams and partner Ellen Gates Starr, Hull House staff investigated area working conditions, sanitation issues, unscrupulous politicians, pushed for better schools, better libraries, unemployment compensation, workers' compensation, child labor laws, the list goes on. They were determined to bring about reform and made their voices heard. Now, in case you're thinking, yeah, but what else? Also, in 1904, Jane Addams became a founding member of the National Child Labor Committee, which played a key role in the passage of the federal child labor law in 1916. In 1910, Yale University awarded Adams the first honorary degree ever given to a woman. Two years later, in 1912, she played an active part in the Progressive Party's presidential campaign for Theodore Roosevelt. Adams was not without her detractors. As a pacifist, she was an outspoken opponent of World War I, which caused her to lose allies and, for the first time in a very long time, face criticism for her efforts. Nevertheless, she persisted. Adams joined in the movement to ensure women's right to vote and served as vice president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, Adams was also a founding member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, and was involved in the founding of the American Civil Liberties Union in 1920. And by the 1920s, there were roughly 500 settlement houses across America, much of the credit for those going to Jane Adams and her band of social reformers at Whole House. After suffering a heart attack in 1926, Jane Addams never really regained full health. On December 10, 1931, as the Nobel Peace Prize was being awarded to Adams in Oslo, she was being admitted to Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. With that award, Adams became the first woman in the United States to win the Nobel Peace Prize. Her share of the prize was a little more than $23,000. That's nearly $400,000 in today's money, which she donated to the Women's International League for Peace. On May 3rd, 1935, voices from London, Moscow, Tokyo, and Paris joined those at McPherson Square in Washington, D.C. to honor Peace Crusader, as she was referred to in the press, Jane Addams, in the first World Peace broadcast, which was part of the 20th anniversary celebration of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which Adams, of course, founded in 1915. Diplomats from each of those countries were on hand here in the States to introduce counterparts in their respective countries. The damp, chilly weather compelled 70-something Jane Addams to stay in the shelter of a nearby broadcasting studio. A little more than two weeks after that event, Jane Addams fell ill and was taken to Passivant Hospital on Superior, now part of Northwestern Hospital. Doctors operated to repair, as they reported, abdominal adhesions and quote although she was an excellent strength for the operation she lost ground steadily thereafter end quote her physicians issued a bulletin that included the line quote miss adams is losing ground rather rapidly and constantly end quote when she passed on may 21st 1935 at age 74 It was front-page news around the country and in other parts of the world. It was also revealed that she had been suffering from internal cancer that had spread. On the afternoon of May 23rd, funeral services were held for Jane Addams in the open courtyard bounded by the buildings of Hull House. According to police of the nearby Maxwell Street Station, 2,000 men, women, and children from the neighborhood filled the courtyard, with nearly 4,000 more persons lined up along Halstead Street to pay their respects. The report in the Chicago Tribune included that, quote, the Greek, Mexican, and Italian business houses of the street were hung in purple crepe or purple paper ribbons in mourning for Miss Adams. 
When Jane Addams was laid to rest on May 24, 1935, it wasn't in Chicago or one of the overseas cities she visited during her travels. It was back in the small town where she was raised, Cedarville, Illinois, near the graves of her mother, father, and her eight brothers and sisters. Her casket left Hull House that morning and was taken by the Illinois Central train to Freeport, where it was met by Freeport officials and townsfolk. While the church bells of Cedarville chimed, the procession of cars following Adams Hearse rolled through town, stopping on a small street near a house built in 1857 by Jane's father. 100 people waited there to pay their respects, and 200 more soon passed the closed casket. One of those who gathered in the back room of the house where Jane Adams was born was 90-year-old Mrs. John Henney of Freeport, Illinois, who remembered Jane Adams as a, quote, delicate but happy child. With 500 or more people in attendance, the ceremony at the graveside on the warm and sunny afternoon was short. Blake's poem, Milton, was read, along with a prayer and the 121st Psalm, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. As one newspaper reported, quote, the setting was as tranquil as Miss Adams, the sometimes militant lover of peace could have desired. Development of the University of Illinois at Chicago campus in the 1960s brought the wrecking ball to most of the original Hull House settlement. In 1965, Hull House was designated a National Historic Landmark. It was listed in the National Register of Historic Places the following year. The Hull House organization moved to a former American Legion Hall on Broadway, just north of Belmont in the East Lakeview neighborhood. That address became known as the Jane Addams Hull House Center. The Broadway facility offered art classes, adult literacy courses, child care, and theater programs to the working class residents of the area, according to the Chicago Reader. It also became the home of the Lakeview Pantry, Free Food Pantry, and several theater companies, including the Steppenwolf. In 2002, the Whole House Association sold the building. It was eventually remodeled to become the Lakeview Athletic Club. At its peak, more than 9,000 people a week were provided for by Whole House for medical help, the art gallery, the citizenship classes, a gardening club, the gym, and other sports programs. But in January of 2012, the 123-year-old institution known as Whole House announced it was closing its doors and filing for bankruptcy. As Whole House primarily relied on government funding during a time of severe federal cutbacks, those shortfalls in cash flow could not be overcome. The Jane Addams Whole House Museum in Chicago occupies two of the original buildings of the Whole House Settlement, the original Whole Home and the Residence Dining Hall, which is now a beautiful arts and crafts building that has welcomed some of the world's most important thinkers, artists, and activists. If you enjoyed today's episode about Jane Addams' contributions to society and the development of Whole House, do you have any questions about anything covered today? Anything to add or have an idea for a future episode? If so, I want to hear about it. Send me an email at chicagohistorypod at gmail.com. Want to know more about Jane Addams and Whole House? Follow the links in the show's notes to purchase books on those subjects. Any purchase made through those links won't cost you anything more, and it will help the show. If you enjoy this podcast, please rate and review or tell a friend about it. It will help the podcast grow and reach new fans. And your written review may even be featured on a future episode or on social media. In addition to listener Becky's Jane Addams art for this episode, much of the Chicago History Podcast original art used on the social media pages was created by John K. Schneider. Thanks, Johnny. He can be found at Angel Eyes Art JKS on Instagram or via email at 
angeleyesartjks at gmail.com. We'll be back next week with another chapter in Chicago's history. Until then, get out and explore when possible. Check out the link in the show's notes and take a virtual tour of Jane Addams' whole house. Learn more about whatever city you live in and stay safe.